it's my privilege and honor to uh, quickly introduce each of our esteemed panelists, starting with Mr. C.V. Raman, Executive Director, Engineering at Maruti Suzuki, Mr. Rakesh Sharma, Executive Director at Leading Two-Wheeler Maker, Bajaj Auto, and he, who is also the president of IMMA, that is International Mot Motorcycle Manufacturers Association, Prashant Doreswamy, the country head continental group in India. He brings, he will bring in the tier one perspective, not only as a, in India, but also as not only as a player in India, but also the global perspective. That's a G Parthipan, a veteran in the industry. Uh, and uh, he will represent uh, Rani TRW, who we all know is a leading manufacturer of uh, safety equipments like, uh, like airbags and seat belts, along with some other products. And Dr. Seshu Bhagavatullah, Indeed, a highly regarded a veteran in the from the global and Indian automotive industry. Till recently, he was with Ashok Leland uh, as the form as the president of New Technologies, and before that as the uh, as the commercial vehicle OEM CTO. Now he sits on the board of Volta Trucks, uh, which is an exclusively electric uh, uh, commercial vehicle manufacturer. He sits there as its director. So. Welcoming everyone, uh, gentlemen, uh, to this very special uh, conclave. On that note, I would like to uh, invite Mr. Raman to kindly you know, share uh, his quick thoughts uh, along with the presentation, which will also set the context for the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mr. Raman. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, good morning to all the panelists. Uh, I would like to give my... Uh, uh, view on the uh, uh, safety uh, India context. Uh, this is uh, uh, so uh, as everybody is aware that uh, India is the fifth largest automotive market uh, uh, in the world. And uh, it's uh, also a big contributor to the economy as far as India is concerned. Uh, from a GDP perspective, from a, a GST contribution perspective, and also from an employment perspective. So uh, we had talked about, and uh, Mr. Selesh had also talked about cases, and that's the future trend as far as the auto industry is concerned. So in the global context, uh, ACES is uh, autonomous, connected, electric, and shared. And so therefore, the growth drivers for that is uh, uh, to make uh, mobility safer, fatigue-free, uh, also accessible and convenient, uh, also have zero tailpipe emissions and better asset utilization so that, and uh, reduction of congestion. Uh, India perspective is uh, a little different. Uh, India has a, a low GDP per capita. It is almost one ninth of the US. Uh, so it has a low purchasing power. Uh, it has very high congestion. And uh, this is what is happening is over the years, you can see that in all the metro cities, the high congestion is leading to uh, reducing uh, uh, speeds and it could be all as low as 20 kilometers to 25 kilometers per hour. Also, we have high pollution, high import bill, and uh, energy uh, uh, and ecosystem and environment uh, is something which is very key for India. And the, and the other thing which is uh, important is the high road accidents. And India ranks number two as far as the uh, fatalities is concerned. And uh, uh, Japan is about uh, four. So, uh, so uh, how do we look at ACES in the Indian context? In the global context, ACES. Uh, as we said, is autonomous, connected, electric, and shared. But for the India context, we are looking at which are something which is a affordable solution because we are value conscious as a customer. Uh, we also look at, uh, uh, we need to have, uh, because of the high congestion, uh, connected and shared is something which is going to be uh, important and growing in the mobility sector. Third is that high pollution and import bills for environment friendly technologies, uh, uh, hybridization, electrification, and alternate fuel is going to be key. And lastly is the higher accident rate. So we need to make safer mobility. So India, in the Indian context, I believe that the ACES is, is affordable, connected and shared, eco-friendly and uh, safe. Uh, so uh, going forward, when we look at uh, the, uh, 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 the accidents per vehicle, and if you see this, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the fatality uh, is about, uh, 151,000 people uh, had died in uh, uh, 2019. This is as, the, as per the 2019 uh, statistics. 
uh, and uh, the total accidents were about 449,000. And two wheelers contributed to a very high percentage of this uh, fatality. Also, from the reason for the road accident and road type contribution, also if you see uh, that uh, we have uh, uh, mainly it is in the highways. Uh, of course, it is there in the other uh, 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 other roads also in the metros. Uh, but uh, the major cause of this has been uh, over speeding. And uh, if you get it a little de deeper into it, uh, the uh, if you look at the car uh, fatalities, it's about fourteen percent is on account of uh, you know not wearing a seat belt the fatalities and in the two wheelers about 30% is because uh, not wearing uh, helmets i think that's one of the key things so um, uh, violation of traffic rules uh, is one of the main reasons for this going forward i think uh, impact of seat belt usage uh, um, as i mentioned the usage also is very low as far as india is concerned uh, as auto manufacturers, we give uh, five seat belts in a five uh, uh, five seater car, but predominantly you see the driver using it. Many times the co-driver uses uses it, uh, and but the uh, rear passengers don't use it. And this is something which we need to educate and enforce uh, going forward, and so that the seat belt wear, wearing improves. Uh, and uh, uh, people would be aware that 56% uh, reduction in uh, injury criteria can happen if you wear the seat belt and if you have the airbag it will further improve that by another uh, 10 to 12 percent uh, so uh, as we talked about fatalities uh, and this also uh, uh, if you see it also varies with the occupant uh, age uh, in the vehicle and uh, the higher age of the population are most susceptible uh, to fatality in case of a, a collision and uh, non-usage of seat belt as is, is is one of the key points India has unique challenges and uh, from a road uh, length perspective, India has a high, uh, uh, second largest road network. Uh, uh, we are building world-class infrastructure, but many of the uh, uh, roads have, uh, uh, you know, a lot of other uh, uh, issues and they are very uncertain uh, because of the, uh, uh, you know, quality or of the one maintenance of these roads. And uh, India has very well-defined standards for lane marking and within metros and big cities you do see, but most uh, uh, roads are lacking proper lane markings and that's uh, something which is unique to india so safety uh, how what how would one should approach safety and so safety should be safer roads uh, safe speeds uh, for the safety of the people and safer vehicles so uh, uh, safety is uh, i believe it's a, it's a also about abnormality uh, consciousness about how conscious you are about safety and it's a very 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 individual thing and that's i think if that uh, goes uh, in a, that education goes across the population, I think we can start in, ensuring that uh, the you know the people take more uh, uh, precautions and uh, have uh, uh, we have lesser fatal fatalities. So uh, Mr. Chandra also talked about this. So we need to have a safety ecosystem. We have to have active safety. We need to have post crash care. We have to have uh, environmental uh, safety, and we also need to have passive safety. So uh, these are uh, things which you know technology can be put into the vehicle so that we can enable that safe uh, to safeguard the uh, you know uh, uh, passengers. But uh, uh, the uh, vehicle user infrastructure uh, and the ecosystem also need to uh, move uh, in sync with that. So we need to identify, ideate, and experiment solutions for India's specific problems. And so if you look, it's at the tip of the iceberg and what you see is uh, the 151,113 uh, fatalities, but we need to have a deeper analysis into this, uh, uh, you know, like any other quality issue when we look at the, uh, you know, root cause. Uh, this is a famous example uh, where, where you see that, you know, when you dig deeper, you find many other things. And so one of the things is that we need to have a national accident data for identifying the core issues. So. Um, but quality uh, accident data analysis is required. We need to have people who should be uh, well trained to be able to do that. And uh, India has a, a very uh, uh, unique uh, perspective because uh, if you look at the uh, vehicle speeds uh, in uh, uh, you know across the world, uh, they may be much higher. Uh, you know, 80 kilometers, 100 kilometers, 120 kilometers. India has uh, at many points has a much lower uh, average speeds and also the Limits are also uh, 40 kilometers, 60 kilometers, 80 kilometers, and only the highways somewhere we have, uh, you know, higher numbers. 
So I think that is something which you need to see that perspective of the uh, road accident with the road, uh, 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 you know, speeds and what is the analysis? How do we look at that in this analysis? Uh, so therefore, we need to develop a long-term roadmap uh, from a regulatory perspective and uh, from the India context, as I mentioned, we need to look at uh, all these aspects uh, and we have to have a clear policy uh, and we need to definitely bring in the new technologies. Uh, we need to have better timelines. Uh, we need to have well-planned uh, timelines, well-defined. Uh, and uh, also we need to provide, uh, uh, promote collaboration among different stakeholders. So uh, when we are making regulations, we need to have collaborate with the, you know, the uh, uh, road uh, engineering people, the test agencies and uh, so on and so forth, so that we are able to uh, make uh, regulations which are you know, going to impact and benefit the society at large. And similarly, when we make technologies for uh, on the vehicles, we need to collaborate uh, with the, uh, uh, with the uh, component manufacturers, with the system suppliers, so that we can get uh, better technology. And so all of this should be mutually agreed uh, across, and we should have a nodal agency which should be looking at this. You know, MORT has already uh, made uh, the uh, uh, National Road Safety Board. I hope that that is going to have a, a, a look at all of this in, in a very, very holistic manner. So uh, uh, we need to, uh, so uh, when do we, when we look at these timelines and we need to, need to look at regulatory roadmaps, we need to categorize prioritized regulations. We need to have, uh, we need to implement in a planned manner with sufficient advanced study. We also, as we are, uh, uh, our market is, uh, you know, uh, uh, at a, uh, at the lower average pricing. So how do we make uh, these solutions affordable and how do we link that to benefits and uh, a, a imperatives which we uh, take, uh, which can you know, enable uh, uh, lesser or no fatalities. And uh, we need to develop uh, efficiency by developing the associated infrastructure and technology uh, and link it with the product development. So uh, one needs to look at a holistic approach uh, towards safety and uh, for doing that, we need to harmonize all the four E's, which is uh, uh, we need to educate people uh, uh, and so that, uh, you know, the safe driving behavior becomes key. Second is we need to engineer the roads. We need to engineer the vehicles uh, to in sync with the requirements so that uh, the fatalities are reduced or made zero. Third is that we should have the enforcement. So whatever are uh, the requirements, people are, uh, there is a proper enforcement which happens so that uh, these, uh, uh, rules and regulations are followed. And then, of course, the lastly is the emergency care. I think the trauma care centers, that is something which we need to ensure that uh, all of this happens uh, in sync uh, in a very holistic manner. And if we can do that, we can achieve the vision which has been set by the Honorable Minister, uh, Mr. Nitin G. Gadkariji, uh, who has said we would like to reduce the road fatalities by 50% by 20, uh, 2025. And going forward, uh, we believe that Vision Zero and such uh, imperatives are going to be very important for India. Thank you very much, uh, Raman San, uh, for sharing a very holistic uh, uh, presentation uh, uh, in terms of your uh, views on how India can accelerate uh, better towards safer mobility, including the, some of the suggestions, which uh, which I, especially the what I found really very valuable is the uh, suggestion for the harmonization of the four E's namely education, engineering, enforcement, and emergency care. Uh, indeed, some of uh, the thoughts that you shared will serve as uh, talking points, uh, discussion points uh, throughout the rest of uh, the session. So once again, thank you very much for sharing your presentation. And uh, now I would like to come to Mr. Rakesh Sharma to give a the two-wheeler perspective, because uh, uh, given the number of road fatalities in India, which has been uh, shared in the presentation by both Mr. Chandra and Mr. Raman, uh, because of the population size of two wheelers, it is also among the largest uh, segment in terms of when it comes to road fatalities along with commercial vehicles. What is the trend going forward in terms of you know, adoption of safety and making uh, two wheelers increasingly safer, in addition to, of course, consumers getting more aware? Your thoughts, please. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there have been a couple of very nice presentations by Mr. Raman and by uh, Mr. Chandra, which have been very, very uh, comprehensive. When it comes to uh, two wheelers, you're absolutely right. The uh, numbers are overwhelmingly, uh, you know, uh, contributed uh, by the two wheeler segment. But uh, most of the time, 
and this is a, a phenomena right across the world most of the time the two wheeler driver uh, rider is a victim uh, and uh, you know there are enough studies done and uh, uh, these tell us that a two wheeler rider is about 20 times more likely to lose his life than an occupant of a car uh, <clears throat> when it comes to oes uh, like us safety of course is a very very important issue but for a um, two wheeler manufacturer it's not just an attribute it's an existential issue because there is a segment of potential customers who don't buy two wheelers because they consider it an unsafe option to ride around. Uh, you know, there are many countries in the world where to develop the market, we first go and engage with the parents of children and, you know, teach the, uh, the kids safe driving to, to develop the market itself. So having a safe experience on a two-wheeler is an existential issue for a, a two-wheeler company. It, uh, the business is critically uh, dependent on it. Now, uh, having said this, uh, in uh, said this as a context, a key point which, uh, uh, which needs to be sort of um, bounced up in terms of its uh, reckoning is the early inclusion of the requirements of the two-wheeler in public policy. The early inclusion, uh, uh, most of the time, the auto industry, meaning four-wheeler, six-wheeler industry being much larger and uh, much bigger, the agenda uh, tends to get set uh, by that segment, and rightly so. But here, when you see the accident contribution, the fatality contribution, uh, like you mentioned because of the numbers, is actually from the two-wheeler segment. And generally, that voice needs to be uh, brought in to, uh, in public policy dialogue uh, at an early stage. Uh, people have already talked about the, um, uh, the holistic approach and the and this, you know, will contribute a lot towards the right type of environment shaping. Uh, you know, predictable road geometry, uh, signages, shoulder and road, uh, uh, you know, border, which uh, these are the kind of zoning. These are the kind of things uh, which uh, uh, a, a two-wheeler rider has to uh, face uh, much more. And if you look at the accidents from a different perspective, a lot of the accidents are caused mostly by being able, unable to perceive the threat. You know, so if you cut it in two ways, uh, perception and reaction, it is the failure of the two-wheeler rider and the four-wheeler uh, driver to perceive a threat, which causes most of the accidents. It's not the reaction time that also is there. And then the vehicle, uh, you can do many things in technology to uh, reduce the vehicle. You can also do uh, things to uh, reduce the threat perception built into the vehicle. But a lot of the ability to perceive the threat or perceive the unsafe situation uh, comes from how the environment is shaped and how the training is done. And this must take into account in its conception and design uh, the two-wheeler. Most of the time, the two, uh, this is an afterthought. And this contributes towards the environment being slightly less safe and with all the you know, chaos which we have on our uh, Indian roads and all that, uh, it um, you know, uh, contributes more uh, towards that. So that's, uh, I thought I would, uh, uh, having heard very, very fine presentations, I thought I would just add to that uh, uh, with this aspect. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, uh, uh, Mr. Sharma, it's uh, very crucial that uh, the two-wheeler segment, uh, especially when India uh, ranks uh, as uh, an, on top in terms of the industry size. Uh, now, uh, let me, mm, we heard the four-wheeler uh, industry perspective, the two-wheeler industry perspective, 
let's hear the commercial vehicle uh, industry perspective uh, from um, Dr. Seshu Bhagavatula, who is the director, currently director of Volta Trucks, till recently the uh, president of uh, New Business Initiatives and formerly the CTO at Ocho Cleland. Some of the products from the programs which he initiated are seeing the light of day now. So we'll, we'll look forward to hearing from Dr. Seshu, your thoughts, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sumantra. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, you know, let me make this little personal uh, so that, uh, you know, it, it uh, uh, comes across to people, uh, you know, the younger ones, especially who are attending this, on how actually does one do, uh, you know, logical development of such a thing. All I had to do was to just go back into my own past. In 1990, when I was a fresh PhD from University of Stuttgart, <clears throat> I joined Daimler Benz. <clears throat> you know, the Mercedes Benz, the famous one in Stuttgart. That was 32 years ago. So, you know, fresh PhD in radar sciences, you know, I was a high frequency technology person. My job actually was to design a radar system that would identify uh, on the road snow, ro you know, water or, or uh, you know, uh, whatever that happens in the road, you know, there were stones, every object that was appearing on the road should be identified by the radar. This was 1990. Now you can imagine while we were doing that because we were actually developing a radar that would scan the road and get an image we recognized, you could probably also measure the distance of the car that's in front of you, <clears throat> which was the birth of the so-called distance warning radar sensor. You know, today, today all the technologies that you see, automatic cruise controls and others, they are, the base of this is measuring the distance from the object in front of you, which is typically a car or whatever. Now, you know, so, so this whole thing started with how, you know, so how do you avoid, how do you avoid an accident? You can avoid an accident if you know the distance to the car in front of you. Now, later on, we also came up with many more things. One of them was now um, a philosophy or a strategy called uh, pre-crash at the time of the crash <clears throat> and a post-crash. Now, what is all required before the crash happens? Now, you can do assistance. You can warn the driver and you can tell them he's too fast or he's taking too fast a turn, whatever. So you can do many things at the pre-crash stage. So, and at some point or the other, your system in the car decides that you are, are the crash is inevitable. Now that's where you do lots of things to prepare the car and the passengers, the occupants. This is at the time of the crash. Now, accident happens. Naturally, you try to reduce the impact of the accident at the time of crash. Now, the third thing that people then concentrated, I'm talking about, you know, my own uh, CV, so to say, was what do you do after the crash happens? What is all required to help, right? And so out of which came a long years of strategy, which probably could be called as the birth of the ADAS, what we call today, including CASE. Now imagine pre-crash. So there were, there were bright minds sitting together, deciding on what is all required. Now, during the daytime, your eyes are all right, but you're not seeing properly that something that's coming from the side. Now you can see front quite well, but not on the side. Now you require what you call today, blind spot detection or something from left and right in the crossings. So, and so there was a big strategy and we said, what happens in the evenings if the light conditions are not all right? Then we said, okay, let's look at uh, infrared sensors. And then parking was a problem. So then we looked at acoustic sensors. So now you see, just by this, just by these three, the definition of three phases, <clears throat> the pre-crash, at the crash, and the post-crash. Now at the crash, as I said, once the system decides or says that the accident is imminent, that's where we said, okay, we require probably an airbag. 
Initially, we started with the frontal airbag, but later on came the side airbags. Now, uh, for the driver initially, and then for the co-passengers, for the occupants. Now, out of which then came the question on, if there is a child inside the vehicle, uh, you should not actually have the airbag going off. Now, you needed to identify who's sitting. There came then the technology called occupancy monitoring system. <clears throat> you do either through a camera or by weight sensing or whatever. <clears throat> Today, now it's so advanced that there are systems that actually measure where is the head of the person so that the airbags actually take off in that particular direction. So that, you know, the normal airbags just take off in one direction, right? That's all right, probably for the for, for the driver, but not for everyone else. So now, um, now that's, you know, so at the time of crash, um, there were there were all kinds of technologies looked at. Today, they all have become part of the designs, right? Some of them actually became part of the legislation that came from the governments, which, uh, you know, the speaker spoke very nicely. And uh, um, now at the time of the crash, and then came the post crash. Now we said, what is required for the post crash? One of the first things that requires is where did the accident actually happen? You needed to know the exact coordinates of the place where the accident actually happened. Now, out of which was born the whole navigation systems. Now, initially we were fighting. I can still imagine those late evenings. We were, we were all uh, breaking our heads on finding out where exactly was the location of the car. Now, initial, initially we did not have differential GPS sensors. We had just a simple cheap sensors and the accuracy was 50 square meters. And uh, for post-crash, uh, important thing is when does the help actually come? How fast? Now, the helicopters actually landed, I'm talking about the German highways, the helicopters landed on the wrong side of the highway. In the night, ice, snow, you know, and the visibility poor, and they landed on the highway, but on the wrong side. And that took 20 minutes for the crew to come to the other side, to the accident site. So we lost lives because of this 20 to seven minutes was the best. So then came the question on how to improve it. So then came the differential GPS and all kinds of other things. Now, actually, today sensors have become more or less much, much cheaper than what it was in those days. When we made the first radar, it costed us 18,000 euro. Today, you can buy a radar for $10. <clears throat> Imagine the development that took place over the time. Now, today, you know, which is part of the ADAS, you know, you define uh, those levels of uh, driver assistance systems that would ultimately go to one day, hopefully, driverless uh, traffic. Um, but then today, people talk about it's not just sufficient that you have full of sensors inside the vehicle, but uh, the roads, the infrastructure has to be equally intelligent. Indeed. Now, uh, we can talk about quite a bit on that, but I think uh, we, yeah. I would stop here just to um, yeah. let uh, others also have the time to talk. Thank you very much uh, for Thank the you. attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seshu. And uh, those uh, uh, who, uh, who have, were hearing uh, Dr. Seshu perhaps for the first time must have already guessed how strong a technocrat he is from his, uh, uh, from his uh, you know, thoughts shared here. Again, from Germany, another connection with Germany, Continental. Let's get the uh, perspective of Prashant uh, Doriswami, uh, country head of Continental Group in India. Uh, Prashant, uh, you have heard the gentleman uh, before you. Share, share with us your tier one perspective, the kind of advancement uh, Continental as a global tier one has made. It, it, it's not a plug and play situation here, both in terms of cost and also the application and the environment. How are you kind of managing that? Having perhaps, if I may say, uh, trying to design a best of both world strategy. Yeah. Towards safer mobility. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's really indeed my pleasure uh, to be part of this eminent panel. Uh, maybe if I have to give a little bit of background, I think uh, already uh, many of the speakers spoke about. Uh, in globally today, we have more than uh, 
1.3 million road accidents, yeah, of which uh, India unfortunately is contributing nearly about 11% with about 150,000 fatalities. However, it's not just the number of accidents, but also the development such as vehicle electrification or be it be uh, assisted mobility, as well as rules and regular legal regulations that are leading to increased requirements in terms of vehicle safety and also driving forward the market penetration. So for Continental, the overarching goal is uh, what we call as uh, Vision Zero. That's the safe transport system in which there are no longer uh, fatalities, zero fatalities, zero injuries, zero crashes. To achieve this, we need more than just, just good brakes per se. Yeah? Optimum occupant safety for all road users and above all anticipatory preventive safety functions are an important step towards this goal. So safety, if you ask me, is becoming a vital factor for the success of a vehicle and safety products are becoming dedicated elements in future uh, new architectures, what we call, yeah, which is also allowing this to evolve new system. And safety is by no means a privilege for few premium models, but will be a guarantee for all vehicles. That's what, that's as a uh, continental as a point now, in terms of the braking system, the challenge what we have is, we have lots of technologies, but when it comes to India, as Mr. Raman rightly pointed out, how do we make it uh, affordable? Uh, how do we make it affordable? So with that as the uh, uh, vision zero, the up, so we as a company, we fully understand the sense plan act chain of effects Yeah. So what does sense plan act stands for in the chain of effects in driving? Sensors symbolized by an high stand for product just now, Dr. Bhaktavatsalu, just explain like cameras, radars, or lasers to detect the situations and information in the vehicle surroundings. What does plan? Like the human brain stands for the analysis of uh, sort of a course of actions as performed by this electronic control units or what now we call as a high-performing HPC, yeah? Uh, the act represents by the foot pedal and also the actuators, uh, that could be the braking actuation, for as an example. So this is how we use our uh, sort of a strategy to achieve uh, vision zero. So how is India moving towards the safety? I think uh, realizing the critical need, I think the Indian government has been focusing strongly on safety technologies and making Indian roads much safer than what we have seen in the past years here. Yeah? Uh, one such good example is certainly uh, the ADS. So, and also this requires a lot of uh, new functions to be developed when we are talking about uh, electrification. Why is that electrification important here? Yeah? When I talk about intelligent battery sensor. So this continuously analyze, analyzes the uh, conventional uh, uh, batteries. Uh, you know that the batteries are uh, mounted under the chassis, yeah, so sort of a skateboard chassis architecture. While this design certainly improves the center of gravity of the vehicle, it also increases the equal amount of risk in terms of the battery damages, yeah. A collision or a object flung under the, uh, the vehicle could uh, really cause an impact to the battery leading to a severe damage. I think special protective measures are required to avoid or detect this intrusion. Yeah, for example, an intrusion to a traction battery could lead to short circuit with uh, risk of fire as well. Yeah, so, so the traditional protection approaches like the metal floor plates come along with a significant increase in a vehicle weight leading to reduced driving range. So that's also another challenge for an engineer. So how do you balance this? Yeah, so changing towards an active system which could detect the sort of an impact detection with the lightweight parts can be realized. So that's one from the safety perspective for electric vehicles in terms of the battery uh, production, uh, battery production. So these are some of the technologies which Continental certainly is uh, working on uh, uh, to uh, yeah, realize our uh, vision of uh, what we call as vision zero through the sense plan and act mechanism. So, Indeed, uh, uh, indeed, uh, that's a very uh, interesting approach, sense, plan, and act. And uh, I'm sure with uh, the kind of technology developments that are taking place or already taking place, and as they get localized and Indian market matures further, 
I think these will really make a significant contribution towards uh, safer mobility in India, both on the private as well as public transportation sectors. Thank you very much, Prashant, for sharing your views. Uh, let me come to uh, Mr. G. Parthipan, who is the CEO of Rane TRW. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barua. Uh, first of all, good morning to you all. In fact, I appreciate all of our professional for arranging this conclave, which is very important. Uh, previous speakers, they talked about our country being the number one in terms of uh, road-related accident deaths, actually. And the statistics sometimes, you know, it is uh, going out of your mind. When we talk about 150 deaths over uh, 450,000 accidents, it's quite, quite high. And so many human lives are, you know, getting lost in this. Apart from the life lost, we, we also lose uh, approximately around 0.8 to 0.9 GDP due to, you know, socio-economic cost. It's is very, very sad. Uh, some statistics will really tell you. In uh, India's, uh, if you take India's roads, almost 95%, they are all internal roads. Only 5% contribute to the national and the state highways. But surprisingly, 60% of the accidents are happening only in the highways, national and state highways. So, uh, when we look into the reasons, overspeeding, that is a major contributor in this. And another statistics, two wheelers, those accidents and deaths, they contribute 37% of the total deaths. In the 37%, 30% is straight away people not wearing helmet. Meaning, if you enforce this helmet uh, wearing uh, in a harsher way, and people understand this and they use this helmet, straight away 10% of the overall death we can reduce. That is approximately 18,000 numbers, huge. Uh, so we now we can understand that how serious uh, the road safety is. And instantly, if you look at the death, 86% males and 14% only female. Now, if you look at the stakeholders, who are all the stakeholders uh, to implement this and enforce this and make it happen? I would say there are three stakeholders. Primarily, the manufacturers, that's the OEM and tier ones. And they are the people who design the cars with all the safety features and then uh, ensure that uh, mobility is a sort of safer. And of course, we talk about our fleet uh, for five years, a lot of focus on this. And we talk about uh, active safety and passive safety. When you talk about active safety, it talks about all the action needed to prevent an accident. Of course, government made ABS mandatory and uh, good tires with the good grip and then camera-based systems, collision warning. And these are all some sort of uh, active uh, safety. And only OEMs are working on this. And some of the medium and high-end cars, you see these features. Coming to passive safety, Okay, the accident has happened. How do we minimize the impact? How do we minimize the damage? That's where we talk about seat belt, airbag, and uh, collision controls, and then cholesterol steering column, and uh, you know, alloy, magnesium alloy steering wheel. There are many factors. And uh, now coming to uh, tier one perspective, where we, we also manufacture seat belt and airbags. Uh, in fact, even before that becoming mandatory, we went to all the OEMs, we showcased the products. And, uh, and, and we also constantly updating the technology. Earlier, few years back, we talked about simple ELR, that is emergency locking retractor. And subsequently, we talked about PT pretensioners, uh, which is allowing the body to move in, in uh, doing, uh, which is holding the body. And the moment the accident, you know, after a few milliseconds, it, it's allowing the body to move ahead to minimize the shoulder injury. And then we are also getting into further technology advancement in that. Similarly, airbag. Uh, initially, we talked about a driver airbag. Then we talked about a passenger airbag. Both are mandatory, of course, now. Uh, then we talk about center airbag and the side, center side airbag and the curtain airbag, knee airbag, head airbag. And many, many such advances are coming in this. And actively, we, particip we are participating the OEM, showcasing our technology, and then uh, convincing them on the need to fit in those cars. Of course, cost is a dampener. Of course, uh, you understand that, you know. So we are also... Uh, constantly doing all the value engineering, trying to reduce the cost of the products. And of course, the volume helps us. When you go in the mass, we're also able to reduce the you know, uh, price. And you also talked about seat belt wearing. It's very important. I mean, many, many times people don't, they don't understand. Uh, my personal experience, 20 years back when I was driving a car in 60, maybe 65 kilometers per hour, suddenly a Jeep came from nowhere in the middle of the road, you know. And uh, in spite of my best efforts, I went and you know, uh, crashed against the vehicle. Fortunately, I was wearing the seatbelt, and that saved me that day. Otherwise, probably I will not be talking to you now. 
and similarly the driver also saved because it crashed uh, took somewhere rear of his vehicle so it's very important to sensitize the people the importance of the seat belt and the airbag of course you, you we, we must know that seat belt is the primary restraint system and the airbag is a secondary restraint system so without seat belt wearing airbag is as a sort of meaningless actually so people must understand even i had seen the discomfort in wearing the seat belt of course the moment you talk about any restraint you know people get agitated it's quite natural so government is also doing it bit to you know making it mandatory and uh, fines and so on. so people are trying to get into the habit of wearing the seat belt whereas the policy in our company uh, we don't get into any car where the seat belt is not working or the drivers are not wearing the seat belt and we ensure that all the personnel in our factory and the nearby surrounding and we make awareness campaign and many things we do but beyond your point it's becoming difficult from a uh, tier one perspective that is where the second stakeholder the government is stepping in the regulator and uh, again last a few years a uh, lot of awareness in the government side and they are also making many things mandatory uh, it could be uh, wearing the seat belt or uh, airbag fit man these are all mandatory now and ab is also of course mandatory and uh, they they can also talk about other things speed limiter and uh, more more than anything else it is creating awareness you know among the general public uh, today when you drive in the highway you find that you know generally it is expected that the slow moving vehicles are you know uh, driven in the left side but you always you find a slow moving lorry or you know three wheeler or four wheeler comfortably driving on the right side you know and suddenly you find somebody is coming in front of you know uh, going uh, lights it's something you know uh, only government and other tier one tier two companies we should uh, you know make this awareness that's another uh, point particular to this uh, our country sometimes i used to joke with all the adults coming in what will happen when you drive almost 70 80 km suddenly you find one more vehicle coming in front of you in the same like, what what will you do you know where does uh, you know adults uh, stop in so this is important to ensure that this type of awareness among people on the pedestrians i mean crossing it you know when the vehicle is moving at the road sense is quite important to do that and as i told you helmet in spite of all the push still people they don't wear helmet when they drive of course with all this pandemic one of the biggest issue for us is you know people not wearing the mask and you know uh, adhering to social distance so the moment it something is going to compliance or restriction we take a back seat i think we should change and the third one is the of course the users and we are responsible for the safer road and safer mobility as a user when i drive a car on the road i must ensure that i follow all the traffic rules no violation see the moment we start doing this uh i i feel that the uh, obviously the road accidents will come down and unfortunately last three years if you look at the statistics almost we, we stabilized around 150 deaths last two three years there is no reduction these are all really causing concern so this this is what my macro level views so when you get into further details any clarification sure. any questions i'll be glad to answer thank you for the opportunity samantra thank you very much thank you very much mr patpan and uh, affordability is <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, hurdles in many cases in the indian automotive industry which is very price sensitive i'll come to you on that for front also but uh, let me come back to mr <clears throat> mr raman uh, raman san uh, well uh, not many men know that you you started your professional journey in the in the in the two wheeler industry uh, so uh, i have a two prompt question one is uh, do you think uh, the safer mobility curve in india is growing in tandem with the advancement in uh, automobiles both uh, two and four wheelers and what is your view in uh, uh what is your take on the need for uh a more inclusive uh uh opportunity for wheeler manufacturers in the overall uh policy at the beginning of the policy making stages uh, it's a very interesting question but i think uh, it's very important i and i very strongly believe that uh, india is very unique you know and when you look at uh, regulation forming which is happening in europe and japan or the usa Uh, 80% or 90% of the vehicles are you know four wheelers and uh, very niche uh, lifestyle vehicles are the two wheelers india is just the reverse in terms of the overall automotive production usage and the vehicle park perspective and so two wheelers is a very important aspect and why two wheelers is very important is because of the fact and uh, mr rakesh sharma would be able to tell better about this that it's, uh, it's about mobility is a need which is there for everybody and uh, and still you know today about 13% of the people only in india use uh, uh, a two wheeler 
uh, and uh, uh, a lot of the people use uh, you know uh, four wheelers uh, uh, the, but that percentage is also uh, not uh, not very uh, high uh, because uh, 13% use the bicycle and uh, public transport is just 18% so uh, i think uh, uh, the rest are either on foot or on uh, they don't travel and that uh, you know uh, uh, from that perspective i think affordability is very very key and the two wheeler makes uh, affordable solution for people to move from place a to place b for economic reasons uh, for economic uh, requirements as well as for the personal requirements uh, now uh, when we look at this you know uh, uh, the the transition uh, is important and when we look at mobility we should look at it in holistic form i believe <clears throat> are we able to provide alternative solutions for people to move from place a to place b in a safer way so let us take the example of uh, you know uh, tokyo and uh, delhi uh, and if you look at the metro uh, rider uh, ridership Uh, in delhi is about 1 billion and uh, the population density and everything uh, you know even if you match it uh, the the ridership in uh, uh, tokyo is about 3.5 billion 3.5 times if you look at the bus usage in many of these developed countries is much much higher rate per thousand india is at a very very minuscule level as far as the buses are concerned you know Uh, india has about just 1.2 per thousand and uh, say uh, thailand has 8.6 so i think if you look at china has 8.1 so there is a lot of ridership which is there which is using other means of transport and we need to also look at mobility in a very very uh, holistic way as to are we able to make uh, mobility safer and affordable for people and along that we have to develop the infrastructure for these multimodal transportations and also the the other mobility which is there which is the two wheeler and the four wheeler as vehicles how they can be you know uh, you know made uh, you know safer in a way in terms of uh, uh, the uh, active safety systems or you know uh, avoiding the crash going forward i think the detection phase and the you know avoidance phase is also something which we need to start doing but for doing all of this there is a lot of education which is important for the for the people who are on the road the pedestrians and also the people who are driving and so therefore discipline and enforcement becomes very important and also the infrastructure of road has to commiserate with some of these things so i think that it is not just one thing which we can just uh, you know look at we need to look at it in a overall perspective to see how in the next 10 to 15 years or 20 years how the uh, transition of mobility will change uh, in future and so therefore shared and connected may become a big piece and uh, uh, multimodal transport may become a, a big piece last mile connectivity could become a big piece and so therefore building that infrastructure going forward and mobility solutions will change we are mobility solution providers you know four wheelers or two wheelers but how do we make future mobility solutions is i think what we need to look at that's how i look at it and uh, one follow up question you also talked about safer vehicles while uh, that that's an ongoing uh, effort you know ongoing yes. journey for the all industry players including maruti suzuki you have in your hard tech platform you have maybe the usage of high strength steel or ultra high strength steel and other materials no for which contribute to a safer vehicle is on the rise but at the same time the technology cost versus a, a, and affordability in india it's a very price sensitive market and and maruti suzuki being a player in and mo- most of your volumes in the volume mass segment where where do you see uh, the the challenges and how are you uh, uh, no addressing those challenges over the years and what are the various uh, levers that you're pulling towards i think uh, it's uh, about the engineering challenge and about working with co- collaborating with the supplier partners and uh, to be able to localize uh, in time to build up scales of economy going forward to reduce the cost of that technology uh, is some of the things which uh, which we need to do and i believe in that collaborative approach Uh, uh you know for uh, you know doing this and how can we do and uh, you know there is a strong push of atmanirbhar bharat from uh, the you know from the top uh, from the government and from the honorable prime minister 
so how do we do that localization and you know, a lot of this you know electronics and some of these high technology parts are many of them are imported you, you can we make them locally can we you know do uh, uh, you know can india start doing developing these technologies that's how i look at it that some of these technology development or some of these requirements going forward can india become a a a global base for uh, such manufacturing and such technology development and which should be in a you know scaled up manner which is you know having different types of uh, uh, you know levels for india level uh, versus a europe level versus a, a japan level or china level it could be very different and if we can scale it up we can reduce the cost of development development costs are very important and so uh, what happens traditionally is that development happens in europe for europe or china market or for the us market and it looks at it from that perspective but it does not take into account the india aspect and then you just get that technology and that thought has to be adopted can we look at the reverse part of it and how can we look at it from that perspective is also one just thought but it's it's a, it's a for that doing that you need to have a lot of data accident analysis and lot of other things which you need to be able to put on the table so that you can have this discussion indeed uh, indeed localization is very very key and i'm sure uh, with uh, the atmanirbhar uh, uh, bharat uh, the push i'm sure it will only be on the rise uh, the localization of advanced technologies and we look forward to you know more safer vehicles in the indian roads and of course increasing uh, level of awareness and adherence and uh, and enforcement also thank you very much raman san and i will uh, come to uh, mr sharma uh, i mean raman san talked about uh, you know uh, technologies now uh, in in two years one of the recent uh, new technologies which had uh, has been adopted uh, large primarily because of the regulations is the abs and that is also kind of uh, added to the cost and in a two wheeler a two wheeler buyer is much more price sensitive than a perhaps a, perhaps a, a four wheeler buyer so uh, is there uh, an increased uh, are there increased collaborative efforts between oems like bajaj auto and tier 1 tier 2s to ensure that you offer these advanced technologies but at a much lesser cost uh, by localizing or maybe coming up with some innovative approaches well subhanta so, that uh... is uh, very obviously always a quest to offer better features and better technology at uh, least cost and um, uh, you know use it as a means of improving the vehicle differentiating the vehicle and all that uh, <clears throat> but you know uh, when we load uh, a simple vehicle like a two wheeler with the technologies um albeit Uh, for safety purposes we have to be also very conscious of the uh, fact of adoption uh, it's a tricky balance and uh, you know uh, it can get into a very moral kind of a debate as well but if in the end loading a vehicle with uh, higher technologies le- retards the adoption of the uh, vehicle because of cost then the whole purpose is getting uh, defeated so this has to be very very this balance has to be very very carefully uh, worked out uh, you know for example uh, if you take an abs now we offer as bajaj auto we felt that uh, it's an important attribute and there could be segments of people even in a 100 cc bike who might be uh, very motivated uh, by the attribute of safety and we have gone and offered uh, abs even at a 100 cc level but that is left to the volition of the customer whether they want to choose cbs and abs you know it depends on the customers but uh, if we simply my worry is that if we simply take regulations which are evolving in different parts of the world and bring them here and put as has been the case for example in um, uh, the abs on the 150 cc where nowhere in the world uh, this has been done it just ra- raises the cost prevents the adoption and hits the industry so we have to be extremely careful uh, besides um, uh, braking systems etc there is also uh, you know lighting systems which allow the early detection of a two wheeler rider by uh, the other constituents of uh, the road and each of these uh, must be worked out and a cost benefit uh, has to be carefully done 
so that in the end more and more people are moved up uh, into these safer vehicles and therefore the delta cost has to be kept uh, you know tantalizingly within reach uh, otherwise we may feel very righteous about these but we may not be able to make the desired impact which we want to have desired impact in the society indeed yeah. indeed and 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 the very rightly put a prudent approach uh, towards uh, framing these regulations uh, no, is very 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 crucial to ensure that the end uh, the objective of more, more adoption of safer vehicles is met so thank you for sharing your thoughts on this uh, talking about affordability uh, shant uh, i mean the, the mention of abs reminds me of uh, uh continental if i'm uh, uh, continental being the first uh, supplier to uh, uh of motorcycle abs uh, many years ago before it was uh, uh, man mandated by the government i think it was a twin channel abs uh, though the offering was made the, the response at the market was lukewarm now it is mandatory so uh, because that time the affordability was the hurdle so with uh, your let's say your global tech center here in india Uh, are you being able to develop uh, new newer versions uh, which are more designed for uh, indian uh, indian uh, en environment and application so at continental we've been developing our capabilities in this area for last uh, few years i would say last 10 years you know india is sitting at a uh, very uh, fantastic position if it say till 1970s the vehicles used to be a mechanical uh, uh, parts yeah then slowly we started adding electronics to that with the electronics they came in software so india being the software giant and most of this advanced technologies are basically driven by uh, software algorithm so can we capitalize on that from the rnd perspective that's exactly is our focus uh, with our tech center here in bangalore where we have about 6000 plus engineers working across various technology be it be passive be it be active be it be uh, automated or the assisted or the autonomous technologies yes i think we were the first one to install this capacity for abs way back in 2016 that's almost uh, two to three years before even the regulation came in so earlier safety technologies were considered as the cost addition in a value conscious market like india yeah however i think this is slowly changing i think thanks to bajaj i mean sir uh, rakesh sharma just mentioned i think they were the first one to take lead in this market going beyond the regulation while the regulation talks about 125 cc and above they were the first ones to introduce the abs in the under cc segment yeah so this is changing like i mentioned earlier people today are more aware and accepting of the safety technologies it might take some time to reach a stage where the market demand drives the safety technologies but we are slowly moving there if you ask me also once a feature becomes a mandated our customers slowly look for what sort of what next in some segments yeah this enhances the push for uh, uh, safety technologies uh, dr seshu coming to you i was uh, i was uh, surfing through uh, volta trucks uh, uh, you know website and where uh, one particular statement caught my eye which says which says uh, we are creating the world's safest commercial vehicles but very briefly say uh, ex explain how is it uh, because of the of it of it being electric uh, an electric vehicle therefore certain advantages or the architecture or basically how are you what is the basis of making this claim of building the uh, world's creating the world's safest commercial vehicle you know um, it's an overall philosophy typically right but that goes into the design of a vehicle now um, this in a water trucks is supposed to be or is a, an urban delivery truck so that means it moves most of the time within the urban limits so then you take into consideration what happens to such a truck they're supposed to deliver goods to the shops in the downtown areas in the residential areas so that means you would actually be looking at residents children playing and pedestrians walking so out of which naturally comes the philosophy and what kind of a sensor array of sensors that you require i mean so number one you need to do is uh, the driver himself has to be allowed a visibility that is more than what you have seen till today so in a 16 ton truck that's the first volta truck you would see the driver sitting almost so low that he can see a small child walking 
on the road or playing in front of the truck. Number one, that's very, very important. So, and at the same time, you see the driver sitting in the middle of uh, the vehicle, not on the left and not on the right side, right? So this actually gives, you know, at 220 degrees of visibility, that's just giving the driver uh, the kind of visibility that's still not yet possible with uh, you know other vehicles. That's because of the property of being inside the urban area. Now, the, the materials that we use are, are extremely lightweight. They have uh, certain properties that actually reduce the impact of the accident to such a level that you would almost have 80% less impact than a traditional, even upper, you know, premium cars. Uh, and, you know, sensor wise, you know, you can imagine there's a 360 degree sensor that gives you complete information, a reverse parking and blind spot and, you know, whatever you talk of, uh, both uh, for daytime, for nights and for evenings. So it's completely done. But more than anything else, important part is that uh, it takes into consideration uh, all possible events that take inside an urban area. That's the important part here. So it has a, a recognition system. It does recognize moving objects to stationary objects, right? If you have an electric pole or a, or a person moving, it does identify the difference between them. Talking about Volta trucks, uh, Dr. Seishu, uh, now that you, uh, the, the company itself is, uh, no, is in its in the nascent stage of its journey. Uh, and at, at any point, does it, uh, uh, does it see India as a prospective market also? Yes, in the second wave, definitely. You know, it's it's meant to actually decongest the urban uh, traffic, right? So, and it is uh, pollution-less, zero pollution, actually. So India, definitely, yes. It's meant for cities, basically. And if you want to do something for the environment, you actually start with the cities first. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Seisha. Uh, Mr. Patipan, uh, you know, uh, what I was... Uh, 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 Recalling is a set of uh, reports earlier no, uh, when, uh, in terms of crash test results of various vehicles. Uh, the addition, uh, along with the uh, vehicle's architecture, of course, the, uh, the addition of uh, an addition, uh, no, a co-driver airbag has a good bearing on the uh, test results of that crash test results of the vehicle. Now, one of the factors uh, when it comes to India or let's say a, a market like Africa is again, affordability levels. So uh, many say that now these technology the costs that these technologies are, or these components come at and kind of affects the uh, adversely impacts the affordability of the vehicle. So how are you addressing that uh, challenge? It's a big challenge. Uh, way in saying big challenge, uh, one is the cost, another one is the perception on the willingness to pay. For example, let us say we are also making steerings. In the light commercial vehicle, uh, the power steerings are mandatory. While heavy and medium commercial vehicle, sorry, uh, heavy and medium commercial vehicles mandatory. Light commercial vehicle, it's not mandatory. So when the OEMs, whenever they launch vehicles, uh, they give us some ratio. Let us say 30% power steering and 70% non-power steering. But in almost all cases, we find that it is reversed. Actually, 70 to 80% power steering and 20% only manual steering. The reason being, the end user perceives value in that. They say that the power steering is very comfortable. I don't have a shoulder pain. It's the power, you know, fuel, many, many, you know, advantages they say. So they're willing to pay a price for that. Whereas in the case of safety, whether it is the airbag or whatsoever it is, then, you know, the perception, I don't get into the accident, so why should I pay? So the challenge becomes, you know, much more uh, difficult then. So what we do, one is, of course, the regulation. Government is forcing the OEMs as a tier one, but there is no choice. So we find ways and means of reducing costs elsewhere. That's first one, from the OEM perspective. So, and, of course, there could be a marginal increase in the price also. Uh, since it's mandatory, it goes. Uh, however, on an ongoing basis, we also do a lot of value engineering, and the OEMs also do that. To tell you, in the last four or five years, there's a significant reduction in the price of the airbag and seat belt. One is the volume effect. Another one is getting into the VAVE and localization and you know, local engineering and multiple ways we are reducing it. So it, even today, it's a big challenge. Okay. Uh, can, can you quantify in terms of percentage, how much has it come down by, let's say, in the last four to five years, if I take the example of an airbag? Uh, of course, it, it differs from product to product, but I would say at least 15%. 
Uh, at this point, at this stage, we'll take a couple of questions quickly, uh, which have come from our uh, uh, audience. Uh, well, a gentleman Sam Samadhan Bitkar uh, writes, uh, can we implement or set legal requirement of functional safety, which is ISO 262622, to all two wheelers, four wheelers, commercial vehicles, and heavy vehicles in India? Is there any challenge or limitations to implement? Uh, Dr. Seshu, would you like to address uh, this question? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. You know, ISO 26262, uh, that's a functional safety, becomes very expensive. It becomes so expensive that uh, it will take very long before that can be done in the price category that is interesting for India. The reason is uh, functional safety in, in its simplest you know, sense means that the system has to know at any given time its, 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 uh, its status. Am I working? Am I not working? Right? What's my status? And this requires lots of loops of compu computation power. And uh, this, uh, you know, as people talk, you know, people typically use this V model, you know, for requirements and testing and, and uh, connecting the customer requirements to the ultimate product that you deliver. At every each of these points in the V model, you have to take this ISO 26262 into consideration. And it requires it altogether different thinking. And it takes very long and, and uh, um, becomes very, very expensive, very expensive. I don't think that you could actually do quite many things even before you get there with the simpler um, you know, uh, techniques. But I think at this stage, ISO 26262 is very, very expensive. Uh, on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and you, you have, uh, I mean, the, the esteemed panel, pa panelists have really thrown some very interesting light on various aspects on how we can uh, uh, India can accelerate towards safer mobility, how we can make uh, vehicles safer, and uh, of course, you know, contribute to everyone's uh, safety and also uh, help India climb down the list of uh, the number of uh, countries with the highest number of road fatalities. And uh, a lot can be done without any new intervention, you know, as, uh, some, like, as something as basic as using the seat belt and uh, wearing the helmet. And, uh, and of course, in addition to that, increase effort in engineering. And as Raman San said, the harmonization of the four E's. And I'm sure with uh, no, this uh, panel discussion would also encourage all of us to really continue our efforts in this direction towards safer mobility. So uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for sparing your time. Uh, Raman San, Mr. Parthipan, Dr. Seishu, Mr. Sharma, Prashant, thank you very much uh, thank you. for sharing your thoughts in this panel thank discussion. You.